Okay, so without further ado, so this is the feature presentation for tonight. It's Delightful Development with Primo, and that's the component-driven IDE with Mateo. Now, Mateo is a Venezuelan American front-end developer. He started as a freelancer, like a lot of us. I do a lot of freelancing myself. Uh, he worked for a little while at New City, uh, helping develop some large websites for universities. And he cares a lot about an accessible and open web, and I think that's kind of the approach that he's taken to building Primo. Currently, he lives in Cairo with his partner, Courtney, and they are working on Primo together, and they also help serve the local refugee uh, community there. So give it up for Mateo. He's, uh, I'll turn it over to him now so he can take over the screen and let him start the presentation. Thanks, Jim. Let me make sure I do this right. It's that dual monitor keynote thing. Okay, that's really good. All right, you can see uh, one slide, right? Not two? Yep, just one slide for me. All right, All right cool. So, um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction, Jim. Uh, my name's Mateo, and like Jim said, I, I am a front-end developer. Oh, I, I live in Cairo. And uh, I've been working on Primo for the last about a year, and full-time for the last half a year. And uh, the title of the talk is uh, the Primo is a, a component-driven ID. But like I said uh, earlier, before we started, um, it's I've kind of pivoted to instead of calling it an ID, um, calling it a site builder. Uh, and the reason for that is because there are um, a lot of site build or a lot of developers rather who use site builders. Um, and so if you're still if you're still on the call and you didn't hop off when I said site builder, um, I can talk a little bit more about why I'm presenting a site builder. Um, because site builders are, of course, for some people, some developers, we think they're going to take our jobs. Um, some of us are a little bit more secure, and we know that it's really just for, for people who can't code. Um, and they are replacing some developer jobs. But it, it seems a little weird to, to mix a site developer and, and uh, or a site builder and, and developers, um, especially because there are a million ways to build websites. If you're using uh, React or Svelte, Svelte's my favorite. And you've got Gatsby. Um, and you've got uh, PHP frameworks, tons of ways. Um, and besides the fact that we already have plenty of ways to build websites, um, site builders are also difficult or impossible. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to build outside of the set boundaries that they have. Uh, it's difficult or impossible to migrate your site. Uh, the, there's expensive monthly fees, especially for hosting. We know that hosting, especially for us gem stackers, hosting is free. Um, but with site builders, it gets pretty expensive, especially for multiple websites. Um, there's themes, so just you get themes from usually the the, the creator of the the site builder, and they're either well made, or uh, and there's few of them, or they're they're poorly made, and there's a bunch of them, and they just kind of throw them all at you. And again, it's not because they don't run well, but because these systems are really complex, and it's really difficult to to build something that people who can't code can use, and they usually have slow loading times. And poor SEO because of because of that because the markups uh, messier because of what they're uh, using to serve these sites uh, and finally the design and power is limited by the tools so uh, you can kind of edit your components usually but then you have like a color picker as opposed to something like uh, using Tailwind which is a lot more powerful um, and then of course you're you're limited by the tools so it's it's kind of difficult or impossible um, as far as I know to for example import a JavaScript library to do something. Um, to, cool or you know like uh, make a calculator or something inside of a um, a site builder because that's not what they're made for they're made again for um, just to be no code tools um, and compared to actual development there's no version control um, and again I'm speaking in a general sense because there's tons and tons of site builders but in a general sense no version control and uh, like I mentioned no access to modern tools and libraries and it's difficult or impossible to build new components and uh, usually the sites are poorly made 
um, and slow. But despite all those things, developers still use them. And, and so this talk is really um, for uh, those developers that have found themselves using or being forced to use, in a lot of cases, uh, site builders uh, because of those benefits that I mentioned, um, including templates. So being able to use something out of the box. And this is something that's been really interesting lately to see is, uh, is how much of a benefit uh, not necessarily templates, but um, pre-built components, things that are ready to use and that have a, a, a unified um, design, right? So that they look good and they're built well. So for example, uh, Tailwind UI is one that, that a lot of people really enjoyed lately. Um, and it's something that you can take and you can incorporate into your own you know, websites. Um, and what's interesting too, is that a lot of real big websites um, and design teams and development teams are actually using these uh, components that just out of the box. Um, so for site builders, that's one of the biggest, if not the biggest thing that you get from them. But then other things, other benefits include easy editing, uh, no setup, uh, get cloning or anything, or build, you know, setting up a build script, and then building and editing from the browser and building and publishing without code. So these are there, there's a lot more you know benefits uh, to site builders, especially as you start to pay more. Um, but specifically for developers, these are things that still um, are are useful to us and reasons why we use site developers or site builders. Excuse me. Um, so I'm talking about site builders today because, based on all that, site builders are excuse me developer tools. So this talk is for anyone who's felt the pain of being a developer stuck in a closed, slow expensive uh, site builder. And that includes freelancers like Jim. I started uh, as a freelancer. I started learning uh, to code on the side and from, uh, I think it was Team Treehouse. Uh, but I was never able to use those skills uh, when I was building the websites I was building because I was really just building, you know, uh, I was using a, a WordPress theme. I would never see a line of code, would never really have an opportunity to use the skills that I was learning on the side to build websites. Um, and so, and I know there's a lot of developers, um, and I think probably most developers at the freelance level that are using site builders or WordPress with a theme, which is basically a site builder. Uh, junior developers, probably less so, but a lot of times still being forced into, um, into using no code tools or into using site builders. Again, because they, um, if they're a student especially, don't have all the skills necessary that, that, that are demanded of current modern web development. Um, so bootstrappers, same thing, using site builders because they can get up, up and running really quickly and because often they don't have the, the money to pay those monthly fees, especially compared to when they could host it for free. Um, and then employed developers for portfolios. So I know there's a lot of developers that don't have their portfolios after years and years, even if they're looking for work, um, myself included, uh, after a while because Again, the, the the normal ways that we make websites are cost prohibitive, and site builders are just kind of a nightmare to work with, especially if you know the power of code, um, and you know what's out there. Uh, it's just it's just too difficult. And finally, agencies. So I've seen like real top tier agencies uh, are resorting to site builders because there's these smaller projects that they want to work on that they can't. Are you guys still with me? Oh yeah, we're still here. Okay, I just cool. I just I muted know. everybody just to make sure there wasn't any feedback. Um, but yeah, we're okay. here. I don't know if my camera turned off or I guess that's what it was because the light turned off and that's what I was looking at. Okay, and also so folks know um, like I don't I don't know Mateo if you prefer people wait, to wait to the end to ask questions, but I muted everyone just to cut down on feedback. But if you have questions, whatever you can still unmute yourself to. Yeah, I'm totally open to, um, to any questions. You feel free to interrupt. Um, so why are site builders so close, slow, and expensive? I don't think it's because there's any malicious intent in there. They like putting people and developers through pain. Um, I believe the reason is because they don't leverage modern web development. Uh, they, in, in making it, easier for people to build websites without code, uh, they lose out on 
all the things that mo the modern web has to offer. So what they're really doing is that they're writing this line between accessibility and power or uh, predictability and expression or ease of use and potential. Um, to give you an example, on the left, we have site builders. And on the right, we have the normal way that we make websites. And so what site builders have done is that they've become more accessible, more people can use them. Uh, they're I mean, just easier to use and faster. Um, but they're locked in, right? So like I mentioned before, difficult to migrate. Uh, it's difficult to do anything that there isn't that somebody hasn't beforehand thought of um, for you to do, um, whether that's an animation or you know some functionality or something. They're locked in. And of course, our frameworks and, and everything else are as good as ever. Um, and they're incredibly uh, powerful, but they're complex. And they leave out um, and all those projects that I was talking about before in terms of freelancers and junior developers and people working on side projects. And so I love this quote from uh, Rich Harris last year, where he said, um, wouldn't it be wonderful if the tools that we used to build the web were as accessible as spreadsheets are? And so in this case, the spreadsheets are like my site builder. Uh, that's one of the things, that's one of Spelt's overriding goals is to make web development accessible without sacrificing power for power users. When all different people crowd around a laptop to work on the same piece of code simultaneously, that's when great things happen. Um, and so that, that really stuck with me after I saw that last year and was really a huge uh, inspiration for, for Primo in terms of, of like how do how do we make something that's accessible for more people without losing out on the the, the greater powers that we can have and that's not to say that that you can do everything in Primo that you can do like you can ditch Svelte or React or anything else not by a long stretch but that Primo sits between the two of them so that you can if you're a junior developer for example get started with Primo as opposed to getting started with a site builder because the tools that you use in Primo are all transferable to using frameworks as opposed to the tools that you uh, would use in a site builder. And specifically those tools being semantic, HTML, clean styles, and a minimal, a minimal amount of JavaScript or using the DOM or using JavaScript libraries and all that other stuff. Uh, so some, some other tools that um, increase accessibility and power and actually power Primo itself, uh, besides Svelte, which I'm a huge, huge advocate for, um, is uh, Tailwind and so for, um, for styling and actually it's interesting how Tailwind does that because I think one of the main benefits of Tailwind and why it's so uh, powerful and attractive is because it's it drives component driven development because it moves your styles out of another uh, at least almost all your styles out of another um, file so you have to do that context switching between my structure and my styles and it moves that into your structure and I think that um, what was the other one Alpine JS does the same thing for uh, for interactivity. That's really cool. And then Skypack and how it um, enables you to uh, import uh, JavaScript libraries right in the browser and that they're actually um, on the power side, they're actually, uh, what's the word, like improved. Like, so if you're using an IE 11, for example, it'll send you a, a JavaScript to run that with all the polyfills and everything. I forgot what the word is for that, but. Um, and if you're in a modern Chrome browser, it'll just send you the JavaScript that you need without any polyfills. So um, a really, really cool tools that are coming out that, that do both of these things. And so in that same vein, uh, Primo aims to, um, to you know, increase accessibility uh, without losing too much power. And so it's an open source site builder for people who code. So let me show you the... Um, let me get this together, and then I'll I'll get into the demo. Do you have any questions so far? Um, I had a question on. Uh, so I I had used Snowpack in the past. I assume Skypack is similar to Snowpack. Is there an advantage to using Skypack over Snowpack? So Snowpack, the way that I understand it, Snowpack's uh, a bundler. So uh, yeah, like it was felt like it would, right? It's like a bundler, but it uses ESM imports. Or no bundler. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like the so I think, but I think it's bundling, right? Like TypeScript and stuff can't happen in the browser. 
may, I think you can probably do some like Babel pre-processing with it, but it basically, it, it tries to set up ESM imports um, because the browser can, brow like browsers can pretty much handle those these days. Right. So, well, Skypack's from the same guy. So he's using oh. them in 10. Okay. And so Skypack is just like the CDN basically. Oh, interesting. Okay. Cool. I understand it at least. Okay, so. All right, so uh, this is Primo. Uh, and as you can probably tell, it kind of looks like uh, a site builder. Um, so as much as possible, I tried to make it just super simple um, and and really visual. And so um, when I say component-driven IDE, uh, this is what I mean, is that uh, instead of working in files, our websites are um, made of components. And so we work with these components independently. Um, so here's a component. There's a full width component and then another full width component at the bottom. And you can try this right now in your browser if you go to um, app.primo.af slash try. And, uh, and so component-driven IDE, um, the IDE part is when you click edit and, um, and you're pulled into an editing environment with uh, just, that, that's isolated for just this component. Um, and actually this is a symbol and uh, symbols are the reusable components of a Primo site. So if I go up to here to my symbols, I can see that I've got all of these. And if I wanna add one to the page, I can, for example, add a row below here and go to my symbol and add a gallery. Right? And this is constrained. So I'd probably wanna put this inside of a full width section like I did down here. Um, so even though we're working modularly, like with individual components, there's some stuff that is still gonna be at the page level. And for that, we have the uh, HTML so that we can put, you know, uh, CSS and anything else inside of our head tag and before our closing body tag and um, and do the same thing for our whole site. So if we want every page on our site to have something below the, uh, in, in the head tag or below the, um, or above the closing body tag, we can. And same thing for CSS. So um, here I just have some CSS that targets the, um, this copy block. So that adds the padding above and below. And uh, this is something unique I haven't really seen anywhere else, but it, it makes sense in Primo, which is uh, page level Tailwind configuration. So if you've used Tailwind, you know that you have your Tailwind configuration. Usually you have, always have one per project. Um, but in Primo, we can actually write values that are like contained to just this one page. And so the site Tailwind configuration will overwrite the, um, the page Tailwind configuration. And that's how, that's how it goes for everything. So, um, when I look at my HTML, I, you know, this will overwrite everything that's in the page. Um, and then even in my fields, for example, I can write, I can create a, a field uh, for the site called title and then overwrite that on the page level by creating another field called title. Um, and then even at the component level, create another field that will overwrite these values. So basically we just have values kind of, values and styles um, and markup kind of trickling down uh, but only affecting the pages that it's necessary to affect. Um, and I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but when you build a site on Primo, uh, it's it builds it, so it's a static site generator, right? Um, so below, the, like on the surface, it's a site builder for developers, uh, but below the surface, it's uh, an all-in-one IDE uh, and CMS and component library uh, and static site generator. Generator. So it's kind of a self-contained way to build websites, which is what a site builder is. Um, and the, the really cool part about this, about combining um, code with the site builder of unlocking the power of code inside of a site builder is that um, 
it becomes more accessible because price is a big part of accessibility, right? Um, ten ten dollars is is accessible for a person in one part of the world, but it's not accessible for a person on the other part of the world. Um, and this is one of the really cool things that um, has come out of modern development is that it has become more accessible in price and more accessible just in, in terms of availability. Uh, but again, we're missing we're missing out on the um, the ease of use and the uh, accessibility that that uh, site builders bring. So when you combine the two of these, you can, like I just showed you, build components completely inside of uh, of of Primo and work off of existing components. So if I started, for example, if I bring in here the Primo Public Library. These are, uh, by the way, this is a spell component that that's running inside of Primo. It's kind of, it's it's iffy, like it's kind of hacky the way I did it, but it just shows that it's possible. Um, so these are components that you can use right now. They're they're semantic. They're they're um, they're accessible, and they're fully integrated. So, for example, with the with Tailwind UI, you're getting the structure and the styles of the components, but you have to hook up your own, uh, your own integration, your own um, JavaScript. But with Primo, when you copy a component, if I'm going to copy these two and uh, this one and that one, bring it over my site. And I just did something. So I just had to like revert to a commit. So hopefully this works. Yeah, it does. Cool. So uh, I copy those, and I can copy components in this way from any website, right? Um, so somebody else is using Primo, or any Primo site. Somebody else is using Primo. <clears throat> uh, I can, they can, I, I can copy from their site, or they can copy and send it to me, and I can import all the components into my own site. And the coolest part of this, <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, is that these are completely self-contained. They're totally ready to use out of the box. So. Like I just did, I can add a row above there and add a new site header. And and it's ready to use. So it's got its structure. If I look at its code, it's got its structure, it's got its styles because it's tailwind. And it has its interactivity with AOS. And I can import JavaScript libraries in Primo just like this, just with its name on NPM without having to do any NPM install or anything else. And this is because of Skypack. Uh, and so I have the, 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 the structures, the styles, the interactivity, and the data layer, which is the, the templating and also the CMS. So all the fields right here, um, ready to use out of the box. And so compared to a traditional site builder, <clears throat> which, you know, you, you, you have one source basically you can get components from. Primo unlocks a whole new uh, like wave of uh, creativity and collaboration uh, in which anybody can build components inside of the system, can build reusable components and to share them with anybody else. And then you can build off of those components to build new components. So the long-term goal of Primo is that everyone would be able to submit to the public library and everyone will be able to use those components to build their websites and to build off of them to build their websites. Uh, I think it's pretty exciting. And the people working on and using Primo are really excited by it. I've already used it uh, to make a few websites for friends and family, local NGOs, nonprofits, and organizations. It's just something that I would never have been able to do before. Um, or now, even knowing how, how to build websites, never in a million years would I have been able to do that. And, and other people have uh, been able to do this too. <clears throat> And the coolest part of this is that it's free and open source. So if you go to Primo, IF, uh, you can sign in with your GitHub and start using it and use it uh, unlimitedly, like unlimited sites, unlimited collaborators, and unlimited everything. Um, because, and th this is a way to make open source sustainable, like Jim talked about it. I really believe in the power of, uh, of open source and collaboration. Um, and so that's why I've gone full steam ahead on this. But um, because, again, because we're unlocking the power of code, um, this is this is able to, to, to happen and, and to be something that's offered for free and, and that's open source. So you can actually 
host it yourself and have your own uh, your own server where you build all of your primo sites um, for for yourself or for clients or whoever it might be. Um, and so for for freelancers, where before you they were um, you know being forced into these closed off systems, and and, and that's still going to be true for a lot of people because there's there's you know people who don't want to try new things, or there's people who have specific plugins or whatever the case might be. Um, this, this is kind of a specific thing right now for a specific uh, type of developer, but where that developer was a freelancer who, um, you know, was, was locked into themes and, uh, and, and paying for hosting or whatever, um, and setting up CMSs and kind of all this other stuff, which, uh, a developer at, uh, at where I used to work, um, said it best. He said when, when the company is like trying to introduce page builders and everything, he said, they're just taking the fun part away. And that's that's so true because developers we, we like building things we like coding, um, at least all the developers that I've met. We don't like is messing with all the fuss and all this other stuff. And that's kind of I mean in my own experience and that's what I've seen other developers um, deal with is 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 all the other stuff um, when it comes to to you know page builders and um, and using WordPress with themes. Uh, and for students, like I mentioned before, being able to get started immediately to actually put a website out there that's a real website that you actually built. Um, one of, I don't think I mentioned it, but one of one of my students actually just sold his first website, um, and and he he built it from scratch, uh, with with somebody else who was just now getting started in coding, um, and he built it from scratch, uh, and and launched it in eight days, which is just an unbelievable productivity gain, um, and I'm just I'm just so happy to see it happen, um, and because was, without that he would have, again been stuck with site builders or been stuck trying to do this the the long way. Um, which would have been overwhelming for him and, and the other guy who was working with him definitely couldn't have done it. Um, and and for agencies. So um, agencies will build component libraries for at least a lot of the ones that I've seen, will build component libraries for clients and then and then build multiple websites uh, off of those um, off of those component libraries. So to show you what I mean, this is a website I built. Um, while I was in New City, Oklahoma, I developed it. I, I did my part, uh, and and based off of this and adding adding additional components afterwards. But based on off of this design system, this component library, they went on to build seven or eight other uh, independent websites for their colleges and their um, and their uh, like departments. Um, and so that's and that's really the power of component-driven development, right? Is to be able to um, to build something once and then reuse it and build on it in other places to kind of split it into different designs, um, because because it unlocks it unlocks the power of like a cohesive uh, design system and uh, and collaboration ultimately, which is what I'm talking about with Primo. So uh, that's it for me. Uh, if anyone has any questions or wants me to talk about Primo some more or to show the, the actual application or to even publish the site, I can do that really quickly too. Um, that, that was super cool, Mateo. Um, thanks for demoing that. I, there's some questions in the chat here, but before I start going through and reading those and going through my, my own, does anyone want to ask their own question before I start hopping into that stuff? I'll... Uh... I'll ask one if I may. Sure. Awesome. Um, simply because it, it always seems to be a bit of a pain point and uh, a lot of times it seems to be outsourced. Um, how are you, um, what is the image management like at Primo? Image management, like PR? Uh, no, in a sense that how are you, so, uh, and this is top of mind simply because like, so next, you know, introduced uh, the uh, sort of like next images. Uh, Gatsby has been talking about releasing this sort of hocus pocus image management um, uh, solution as well. Uh, Contentful have their own uh, and uh, Eleven E just actually mentioned something that they're working on as well. So, uh, So for someone who, again, doesn't have like, so much experience sort of like handling the, the, the complexity of images now. Uh, what is Primo doing around that situation? When you say images, do you mean like 
like media files or do you mean yes like, yeah uh, sorry media files part okay. essentially oh, and cool. like pictures whatever i thought you're talking about something super like complex that just went over. <laughs> um so uh primo's get back that's something i didn't mention so you sign in with github Mm -hmm. And uh, and and each website that you make in Primo creates a repository, and that's where it stores all of the data and all of the media. So when you upload a file on your Primo site, it's just a, it's a repository. And I think the limit there is like a few gigabytes. Okay. So it's not super robust yet, but it's I mean it, it works out of the box for now. Great. Um, it looked like Chris. It looked like you put your hand up when I asked if anyone had questions. Do you have a question? Yes. I would just say comment is that there's a lot of if you look at a lot of websites. There are many times I, if you do a view source on a website, um, many times you just get like huge amounts of it's, it's like a big jumble. Of code, yeah. And I don't know about the, yeah. I uh, what's it called? Uh, like Prima, yeah. For Prima, I don't know what uh, how Prima would do. I guess it would do much better. Right. Yeah. yeah so, um, yeah, you're talking would be both. Um, but yeah, let me, let me show you here. So uh, when I was talking about site builder, I talked about ugly markup and that's, that sounds like what you're talking about. Um, and that's, they, I mean, they have the best engineers, right? They, they're multi-billion dollar companies. They have the best engineers working there. It's not bad market engineers. I think it's bad markup because they they're they're really complex systems. So, like I mentioned, to build a no code site a, a, or a no code tool, and then people can drag and drop data and create a div underneath it and then change the color of that. That's that's crazy complex. Like so 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 complex. So just kind of naturally because of shareholders not really caring about the quality of or you know caring about semantic markup that doesn't really translate into um, something shareholders really care about. Um, it, it ends up being kind of ugly, uh, and and using gimmicks uh, to to make it look uh, attractive so that people will buy it. But um, if let me share my screen here. But Primo avoids that problem, not because I'm a better engineer than any of those guys, but because uh, because we're actually writing code, right? So we're not using a bridge and in between tool to write our code. We're just writing it ourselves. So when you look at the the markup, um, it's come on. Uh, it's totally clean again because because I wrote it and there's no in between bridge and because we're using Tailwind, uh, it's like all our styles are um, are really really small because that's one of the huge benefits of Tailwind is that the CSS bundle size is really small because you don't have to include you know, all, the, all of these styles are being used across the entire site. It's not just one header style, header class, which imports all of its own styles, right? All of them are using um, the, the same classes and the same utility styles, um, which gets you really, really uh, clean um, CSS. But yeah, markup is, 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 is super clean. That's not a problem unless you write bad markup. And then in that case, I guess it would be um, kind of ugly. Other questions? Uh, you said that that you can put in a, a JavaScript frameworks, like use different frameworks. Uh, does it does it work well with most fr frameworks, or what what JavaScript framework does it not work well with? Do you, is it like a, well, so? Uh, uh, I mean, at at the moment. At the moment, if you're if, if you're trying to just use a JavaScript framework, you're trying to do something more complex that you would need a framework for. Um, I would recommend 
staying away from it for now. I mean, I did, so I, like I said, I put a spell component on the page, but I just did that by like copying and pasting the JavaScript in um, and exporting it from where it's like, for example, if you take like the React case, I was thinking like of like a React component, like maybe it would be able to output it as like a tag that you'd be able to put into your, and like use it like that, but but it's not exactly like that when you talk about a component. It's not like a right. Right. component per se. Okay. So yeah. it's like yeah. maybe they, uh, maybe it's more for like a, if you needed a, a website for a client and it wasn't like a lot of interactivity, like some simple um, interactivity and, and have, it's more for the styling, like having something that is, that would that would aid you in developing like front end sort of things. Yeah. yeah. So it's not for like super complex stuff that you use a framework for. But as far as like you know interactivity, uh, you can you can do that with with just uh, HTML and, and including a JavaScript library. Oh, and and then also uh, as far as backend, can you use it with a different uh, I guess backend languages. PHP, yeah. for example. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, you can, I mean, you can use it with any backend because it's just, it's basically just uh, concerned with the front end of your site. So uh, you could, for example. Um, oh, yeah, like a RESTful. You can do like calls to like a RESTful. Right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that I feel like that would work really well in it, although I haven't had a, an opportunity to try it yet. OK. Right. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Hey, Matteo, uh, this is Lucas. Um, I posted this in the chat, but that uh, self-host uh, WIP button, um, yeah. I noticed the GitHub uh, logo on it. And is that to deploy your site and host it on GitHub? Uh, no, sorry. So it's, it's kind of confusing. Um, apologize for that. So that just, just uh, it means that I'm trying to separate like how you can create a site on Primo AF, and it's, it's hosted by, uh, by, by Primo. Um, or you can self-host it, so like put it on your own server. I, but WIP means work in progress, so I, I'm still like working on that part. I'm hoping to get contributors of people that care enough about running their own server with it that they'll that they'll contribute. Um, but that basically means that you can um, like have have a server where you build and manage all your sites. So you think of like a CMS with where you can make unlimited sites and build unlimited sites from it. That's what you could run from your own server. Oh, okay, I see. I just assume that's uh, that just directs to the GitHub repo where um, people can add those features, as as you were describing. Yeah, I think I could definitely make that clear. Mateo, I had a question around the styling. So it, it's super cool that. Uh, Tailwind's integrated out of the box. Um, that's awesome. Is that a requirement of the project, or could you um, potentially just use regular CSS on your components, or how do you have that configured? Yeah, um, I, I you cut out before Tailwind works out of the box. Is oh yeah, that... uh, I was just wondering: so is, is Tailwind required, or can you just target your um, components directly and write? regular CSS or how do you handle that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so you can just use regular CSS because Tailwind is, is like, it, you can use Tailwind if you want, but you don't have to. Uh, so a lot of people are still using like SCSS. Like I, I was using it to for like BEM and stuff and doing some really complicated stuff with, with mix-ins and just like re really wild stuff. Um, and then I was able to stop doing that with Tailwind. But the main thing they use in SCSS, I think, is like nesting selectors, right? Um, and so you can use nested selectors. And there was something else I forgot what you can do. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you if you if you if you just like writing CSS and you just like nested selectors, you can do that too. And there's no like hit or anything that Tailwind comes out of the box. But it's something I super duper recommend because it's just amazing for again uh, small bundle size. You just Ship the least amount. Um, other people on the team being able to work on, especially if you're working with designers, 
like I've just seen so many designers be able to go into the markup and change colors and change padding and stuff because of those because of those utility classes. Um, and then just being able to like prototype really quickly and build really quickly, like just an unbelievable um, you know difference. But uh, no, you don't have to use Tailwind if if you don't want. To. Cool. And and then I noticed um like you at one point you I think inspected the element and like um the classes had like hashes attached to them like Svelte does. Um, and I know the product's built on Svelte. Is it scoping styles to the component? Like if you were to write CSS on a component level, does it scope it to that specific component or how does that work? I, it's, I don't know if it's technically encapsulated, but it's, it's encapsulated. So um, where, where Svelte, you know, uh, parses, I guess is the right word, um, the markup and pulls out the the class and then like appends another class and it does all this fancy stuff to encapsulate the styles. Primo just kind of sticks all the styles inside of a uh, an ID. So like it it, it gives a, the component an ID and then sticks all the styles inside of it so that they're all encapsulated. So it's kind of a low tech way of doing it. And there's one trade off in terms of like anything you write in the CSS overwriting utility styles. Um, I, I think it's something we can address later, but uh, that's how it does it. Nice. That's cool. Did you write? Is that something that you wrote custom, or did is that something that you're pulling from something, some other project? Uh, you, yeah, that was that was custom. It's just kind of a low tech <laughs> solution. Hey, that's cool. It works. That's a cool way yeah. to do it. Do we have other questions? Sweet. Uh, I saw Lucas say, "Is that deploying onto GitHub?" I think we answered that though. Right. Yeah, I, I typed that before, but then I wanted to just ask in person. OK, cool. Thank you, though. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Thank you guys for the questions and for giving me your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, I, yeah, I really hope that this that this is a help for a lot of people. I know it would have helped me a lot um, when I was starting, but also throughout my career with freelancing and, and building stuff on the web. So. Yeah, I, I, I really like the approach, Mateo. I think. Um, I'm especially big on component-based design, and you're making it super easy to do that. Um, I'm excited to see the component library that you have hosted on your site get built out because that's like something that I've always been excited about. And especially if you can just like copy and paste and share things around, I think that'd be super cool for folks. Um, I I think it'll be the future of the like web development, just like grabbing stuff and, and adding it everywhere. Um, I know I know like there was some promise with like web components and things like that, um, but this really just yeah. makes it super easy to do it. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate that. I'm excited about it too, for sure. Okay. Well, cool. Um, if there's no more questions. Uh, yeah. If, if anyone else wants to talk about anything general or whatever, or we can close it down and uh, give everyone the rest mm -hmm. of the back. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I was messing that up. I was like, I'm, I'm speaking, no one can hear me. Um, and this is, again, super quick. Um, have you you mentioned early in your presentation that uh, a lot of uh, site builders, some of their sort of like uh, downfalls, one of them being that they're they're quite often relatively slow. Um, have you done any sure. kind of like performance testing? You know, any kind of lighthouse audits uh, with uh, anything you've deployed or put out with uh, Primo? Uh, I have, yeah, that's a great question. I thought you were going to ask me if I'd done audit testing on site builders. <laughs> I have not. Um, that's personal experience. Um, but yeah, I think so. Like you could do it on the uh, on 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 the site Primo AF. Um, and I think the last time I did it, it was at least 90s on each, and that was before I had done anything um, to like speed them up. And that's just that's just out of the box again because we're unlocking this serverless technology and and, and uh, static sites, um, which is just it's, it's so it's so easy to get it right, um, especially when you've got clean markup. So cool, yeah, and, and that's also simply because uh, I'd say in the last you know little while I kind of say last year I think a lot of people have quite often sort of like um, tied uh, some performance scoring to. I mean, some of their deployments, right? So I was super curious to see how things are going on your end. Levity has been doing their little uh, performance top 11 and, you know, Next and Gatsby are out there sort of like uh, 
beating their chest as well. So I just wanted to uh, inquire about that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. That'd be a good thing to put on the website for sure. Beat our chest a little bit. Okay. Well, very cool. Um, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, it's nice seeing, seeing, oh, you got another, Chris? Oh, we got a question. Yeah. Yeah. Please. I was wondering if, um, if anyone has tried uh, using Primo with like Yaspi or, or any of the other frameworks, or is that not really relevant? Uh, I think it'd be difficult because, um, so Primo works with the handlebars. All the components are made with uh, handlebar syntax. So I don't know. I mean, it, it could be possible to leverage other frameworks. I know Jim and I were talking about um, if we could do anything with like plenty, like oh, you could stick those two together. Um, there's, there's tons of possibilities. If not now, then at least later. But um, I haven't tried. Sorry. Yeah. But you're welcome to try, Chris. Come by and, and open a, a GitHub discussion. I always thought it'd be interesting to see how, um, like Gatsby plugins, because they integrate with a lot of different things, like you know Salesforce or Drupal or whatever it is, to see how you could integrate that into other projects. So <clears throat> I don't know if that's on your radar at some point, Matteo, but that might be kind of cool to look at. Yeah, definitely. That sounds cool. Um, Chris, did you have something else you wanted to say? Uh, no, thanks. Um, and then also, Mateo, through your presentation, I, that was, I, so looking at the my snow or Skypack question earlier, um, it looks, mm -hmm. so that's cool. So like Snowpack, it, you have to have like your local npm bundles, and then it, it does the ESM imports. Like Skypack sounds like you just like put it in there, and it goes out and gets you just it. Put it in there. That's, that's that works. crazy. I, I like the sound. Yeah, of that. it's really cool. I was actually using System JS before to like to like import modules and get them to work in the browser, but then Skypack came out and he just blew it out of the water. Like it's. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, I feel like I love these new tools. Are that's another thing I could see really being the future for everyone. Just like stop messing yeah. with dependencies locally. Just like <laughs> just reference it. That's so cool. Just include it. Yeah, really, really neat. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, hopefully, you'll you'll join us next month. We have another. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't announced it yet. Um, Lucas, I think we have a little more coordinating we have to do, but we're going to have another talk next month. So hopefully people will come on by and join us there again. And uh, thanks, Mateo. Thanks for coming out tonight and, and speaking about Primo. Um, I hope uh, folks uh, check it out and follow up with you. Uh, I don't know. You actually have an email on your website that people can follow up with if they have other questions. Yeah, definitely an email and a Twitter account. Um, and you can follow the public library for fresh new components. Nice. All right. Well, we'll see you all later. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. <laughs>